Hello, good evening and welcome to Biz First in Focus. The focus of our discussion tonight is going to be the currency, exchange rates, interest rates and the state of investment in the Sri Lankan economy. We're joined by Shiran Fernando, the Chief Economist at the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Shiran, thank you very much for taking time off to, uh, to be, be on the show this evening. Uh, let's dive straight into it. Uh, the stance of the central bank, particularly the expressed stance of the governor of the central bank on the depreciation of the rupee has generated conflicting, uh, has had a conflicted reception from the public, from economists uh, and from pundits. The rupee has crossed the 160 mark. Where should the country be worried about this? Uh, should we take heed of the assurances that have been given by the governor of the central bank, Dr. Kumaraswamy? So good to be back on the show, and I think it's a pertinent discussion to have with the rupee sliding as well. Um, so the governor's comments, I think, has a lot of merit and, and warrant to it because um, right now, generally, um, the rupee weakens when there is, um, you know, that lack of confidence in the system, or you feel like there is not enough dollar earnings coming into the country and there's a lack of uh, maybe reserves or what not to face some of the debt servicing obligations. So if you look at those factors alone, um, take out the in, in what's going on internationally, um, we are seeing better level of exports coming in. Uh, if you look at the export numbers last year as well as this year, um, FDI numbers last year as well as in the first quarter has also done uh, much better. And this year remittances is up. Uh, close to about 5% as well, and tourism inflows are doing better. So if you look at what the revenue or the in foreign uh, income generating um, uh, sources are doing, it does paint a positive picture that the economy, for example, does not warrant that level of depreciation. Then the other argument I think is always brought about... But is it the depreciation itself that is bringing in uh, more, or are we actually doing more in volume? So I think... Um, that as well, and also some of the export markets are doing much better. So the EU, Euro, and the US are doing much better as well. As well, as well. So we're seeing a demand pick up, and then if you look at the remittances side, it's also a function of oil prices as well, because that that is uh, that has picked up, and there is more remittances, for example, coming from some of our source markets. So a mixture of those reasons, and maybe some of our exports have also uh, improved in terms of catering to some of these markets and the other markets as well. So a mixture of those reasons. Uh, but if you look in particular on the rupee depreciation, fr from that point of view, uh, a justified view. And then I think his other point was that you have to take it against a basket of currencies to see, for example, where your real effective exchange rate is. Uh, he said the real effective exchange rate was more like 100. So yeah. What so do you mean by that? So now it's almost at parity. So you almost the rupee has almost found a true value against this basket of ten odd currencies which we're exposed to when you look at where we trade with. So some of our big countries like the U.S., European Union, and those countries are in that basket. So we've come almost to par value. So we've sort of reached that uh, point where it's neither overvalued or undervalued uh, from that point of view. But if you look at if you take the lens zoom out of what's going on in Sri Lanka and look out what's going on in the other countries, uh, we can see that this depreciation or devaluation against the rupee uh, is not only common to Sri Lanka. So if you look at countries like India, if you look at Philippines, um, if you look at even countries like Pakistan, they're seeing so much more depreciation than us. And that is primarily as a result of a significant factor, which is the dollar strengthening. So all these currencies and Sri Lankan rupees reference against the dollar. So when the ru when the dollar strengthens, um, the the countries like Sri Lanka and India and Pakistan, their currencies uh, weaken as well with a strengthening dollar. And so that that in itself has I think been one of the factors uh, wh why uh, the ru rupee, for example, has has come off. And another reason has been the uh, foreigners sort of leaving some of the capital markets. So we've seen outflows from our bond market. If you look at India as well, they've seen significant amount of outflows. And their interest rates, for example, has reached about three-year highs because of these outflows. And, and similar trends can be seen in other times. And if you look at the overall trend right now, what people are talking about is that uh, foreign investors have left emerging markets at a significant pace, similar to uh, the, the last the, the, the pace which was higher was the last time in 2008, when we had the global financial crisis. So 
it's a bit of a global impact I think that's happening and because of that I think um, there's a lot of speculation going on in terms of where the rupee should be. Um, exporters maybe are not bringing the dollars to the market because they feel that they can get a better return if they wait a while. So a bit of a catch catch 22 situation here. Where Against this backdrop, is there a need for intervention or should the uh, central bank intervene to stabilize the exchange rate? So in May, for example, the central bank did intervene um, and that was after several months of not intervening and actually purchasing dollars in the market and boosting the reserves. But in May, they went uh, to the market and uh, they, I mean, they sold, sold dollars, about 200 million net, to defend the rupee. Uh, so they have been uh, they have been putting where, them, uh, where the, the money where their mouth is, to be more precise, in terms of where they feel that the currency should be. Um, so they have been doing it on that front, but I think it's a, uh, maybe a lack of uh, confidence that the rupee may maybe the real value is around this value, or maybe an expectation for the rupee to depreciate further, and then you have these global stories which are not positive right now, which are adding to this concern as well. Sri Lanka is a country that imports a lot. We consume, you, me, um, much of the equipment uh, in this studio is imported. In our day-to-day -day lives, we import a lot. Uh, this continuing depreciation of the rupee, how is it affect, in, uh, what is the impact that it has had on imports so far? Um, so last year we did see an import surge, and not because of the rupee, but because of external factors such as the drought. But I think with inventory that is coming in, you know, what people have awarded from companies were awarded, and when it will come land here, it will be at a higher rate. So if going forward as well, I think it will add to this uh, import cost uh, that is coming into the country, at least on the FOB value coming here and then getting cleared here. So uh, that will, I think, have a bit of a dent, um, but uh, it also will matter for exports as well, because if you look at even the garment apparel exports, a lot of it does depend on material coming in as well. So cotton that comes in from other countries comes here, we do the final product and send it, send it across. So it does have an imp impact on exports as well. So it, it'll, it'll, it definitely will add pressure onto uh, uh, companies, but I think what uh, companies right now should maybe focus on is where the rupee will move forward and then take decisions to hedge against th those kind of expectations. Before we go in for a quick commercial break, do you see this situation with the rupee uh, stabilizing at some point in the near future? I think it should stabilize at current levels because I uh, concur with the view by that the, the real value of the rupee uh, is around the 160 mark. Beyond that, I think it's the, the factors domestically in terms of our revenue generating sources are good. I think once this global situation clears away, when the concerns uh, over the dollar strengthening goes away and subsides, so you'll have a period where um, there will be opportunities for the currency to strengthen. So it's a bit of a wait right now. Maybe you will see an overshoot, and maybe you might see a bit of an appreciation or at least a stabilization at most. Thank you, Shiran. On that note, we're going for a short commercial break. On the other side, what effect will the increase in U.S. interest rates by the U.S. Federal Reserve have on the Sri Lankan economy. Stay with Biz First in Focus. Welcome back to Biz First in Focus. We're in conversation with Shiran Fernando, the Chief Economist at the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, regarding uh, external impacts on the Sri Lankan economy. Uh, when we left off, we were talking about the exchange rate. Now, another uh, sort of problematic situation that has arisen is with U.S. interest rates. Now, you mentioned earlier that we are seeing foreign investors pulling out of sovereign bonds in emerging markets, including in Sri Lanka. The U.S. Federal Reserve has there's the indications that there will be at least four rate hikes uh, in the coming years, in the coming year. How will this impact the Sri Lankan economy? So part of the reason, I think, why the dollar strengthened, as I mentioned in the previous segment, has been due to these expectations of the Fed uh, raising their interest rate. So it's been known for a really long time, and I think the, the market was just coming to uh, grips with the fact that there will be four this year. So we've already had two happening this year, with the one uh, last one happening um, just last week, uh, and another two this, two more this year. So what we're seeing in terms of the dollar strengthening, money moving out, is the markets getting ready for it. So as long as I think there is another two this year and another three this next year, 
uh, which is what is on the cards and it, and it moves according to that plan. I think there shouldn't be further shocks to uh, emerging markets or things like that once the dust settles and once positions are being taken by these uh, managers. So that's I think the silver lining among all this, the fact that uh, once um, this episode of emerging market outflows, which has impacted Sri Lanka and other countries uh, subsides, that uh, things will get better and maybe money will start reflowing once things are adjusted. But I think the concern is whether countries like the US with the level of uh, activity pick picking up the fiscal stimulus that's going up, uh, what the president is trying to do in terms of bolstering uh, the economy, whether that will overheat the economy and that will require further rate hikes than what is planned. So I think that is the key concern there. You're also seeing, seeing beyond the US Fed, uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, also talking about winding down their uh, asset purchase program as well uh, towards the end of the year. So all this, all this points towards rising interest rates, which um, is a concern for countries like Sri Lanka because over the last few years we've been able to enjoy uh, money flowing into countries like Sri Lanka because of the high yield that has come about. So uh, that will put a bit of pressure in terms of interest rates and how we manage our risk and how we go out into the market when we want to raise uh, money as well. So um, it, once again, it will not be how Sri Lanka, for example, faces it, but how these emerging market asset classes perform and then the subsequent impact to countries like Sri Lanka. Um, what impact will it have? Can you sort of elaborate on the impact that it will have on uh, the ability to sell our debt? Uh, would Who would continue to be interested in buying our debt, in buying Sri Lankan sovereign bonds? So there, um, there still exists a lot of funds which are primarily, some of them have what you call emerging market debt funds within their overall uh, overall funds which look at other markets as well. Then you have frontier market funds. Um, so the, it's not like these guys are going to move away. It's about how much they can put given this uh, yield environment. So that will demand for higher yield and in turn domestically that will demand for better economic management because you can't afford to be loose. You can't afford to have higher fiscal deficits. You can't afford to have inflation going above expectations and you can't have negative economic narratives th what we've seen sometimes in the last few years as well. So we have to be careful on that front. There is no longer, I think, easy money coming back into emerging markets. When you say negative economic narratives, what do you mean by that? So you can't have, um, you know, a story where growth is, for example, low because there are other countries that are growing higher above. You can't have um, things where, uh, you know, there is uncertainty over certain reforms, like, for example, VAT uh, reforms being implemented, then taking back, going, going back and forth. Inconsistency. Inconsistency, basically. And that puts into doubt whether uh, with these foreign fund managers and, and portfolio invest and uh, FDI investors, whether there is real serious reform going, going to take place and, you know, uh, improve the trajectory of economic growth. So uh, that has to be avoided and that has to be carefully managed with this rising uh, yield environment because earlier we were competing probably with other countries of similar nature, but now we're competing against an investor putting more money in things like the US treasuries, which are now rising up as well, or take the risk and put in countries like Sri Lanka. Um, against this backdrop of uh, possible uh, consecutive uh, US uh, Fed rate hikes, um, is there any action that the central bank uh, can take? Should the central bank of Sri Lanka be taking any kind of proactive action? So interestingly, in April, uh, the central bank cut its policy rate. So that was largely due to uh, economic growth weakening. I think last year was quite low in terms of economic growth. It was in that backdrop and also inflation easing as well. Um, so that will put pressure on further. I think if the central bank wants to cut more, that will be a bit of more pressure on it because you'll be cutting against a global um, rate rising environment. And we've seen other central banks also raising rates. India did that a few weeks back. You're having some of the Middle Eastern countries also doing that. Uh, other central banks are meeting this week and they're also deliberating whether they should increase their interest rates. So it will definitely put a bit of pressure because you're having uh, domestic growth concerns. So there'll be a domestic growth bias, but you're also having rates rising in, the, in, the, in other countries. So you don't want to cut too much so that foreign investors will start exiting because they're now expecting lower, um, lower returns, lower yields. 
Uh, so it's a bit of a, uh, once again, a dicey situation for the central bank to be in. So I think they will continue to be neutral uh, and keep maybe interest rates on hold and see how the growth situation um, evolves. Let's talk about uh, from a sort of a layman's perspective of uh, interest rates and how it impacts ordinary people. Uh, right now in Sri Lanka, if you take uh, at most banks, the difference between the interest rate on a personal loan and the interest rate on a housing loan is only a few percentage points. Uh, against such a backdrop, can the Central Bank of Sri Lanka afford to increase its policy rates? Um, it will definitely, um, so the room to maneuver that is quite, uh, will be quite difficult to do and maybe sometimes if, for example, if inflation is quite low um, and, and the uh, economic environment is sort of cooling, then it might be uh, not the best move to do so. Um, but I think beyond that, uh, for investments to take place, I think for businesses to make investment decisions, uh, lower in re interest environment will definitely assist. But on the other side, you have a lot of um, income earners, a lot of pensioners, a lot of people who put their money into savings institutions who depend on this interest income as well. So uh, there is that side as well where income is generated from the interest earned on these, and then you have companies which are looking to make big investments or even small investments, some, such as uh, SME companies, uh, who will feel that you know, 10, 12 percent interest rates are too high for them. Um, so they have to balance it according to that and I think where all of that fits in is this growth equation because um, it, it matters for consumption, it matters for investment. What is the ideal rate that the Sri Lankan economy should be growing at at this juncture? The economic GDP growth? Yeah. So the first quarter number came in around 3.2 percent. Um, I think ideally for an economy like Sri Lanka to um, grow at a steady rate, I think at least 5 percent is uh, uh, gen generally a minimum, I think. Uh, but you also need a sustainable growth environment. You can't have years where you have 7, 8 percent, one year, two years, and then suddenly dropping to 3 percent because that's not sustainable. You can't give artificial boost to the economy. Um, so y it's sort of reorienting as well because you're seeing uh, it being now being more export-led uh, compared to a few years ago. Investments are slightly uh, picking up in terms of FDI numbers, so that will boost export growth as well. Um, and consumption really varies, I think, uh, depending on what happens uh, with uh, on the taxes side, in, on inflation side, and global. Uh, Before we go in for a final break, uh, there's an interesting question, sort of a thought-provoking question, let's say, that I want to pose to you. There's a train of thought that has arisen uh, in Sri Lanka recently. It's been existing around the globe for some time. Is there a need for a central bank? Uh, is the only thing that the central bank doing making basically the money that I earn uh, less valuable. Is there any merit to this train of thought? You need when you take into <laughs> consideration current reality. So that's yeah, America. that's a difficult question to answer within a short span of time. But I think you need at least an institution to uh, be able to set out of the guidelines. And I think uh, what you're seeing, for example, digressing a bit in terms of the evolution of blockchain technology and subset of it, which is cryptocurrencies, is the fact that there is demand for m maybe less regulation. But within, within that also you're seeing speculation. A lot of companies are going up and down in, in value. So uh, you need, I think, a perfect balance of both. Um, and so there is a need for some kind of limitation on the powers and scope of the central bank? Um, that's, that's a very difficult <laughs> That's a very <laughs> difficult okay, I want for yeah. you to answer that question. We're going for a short commercial break. On the other side, we'll take a look at the state of investment in the Sri Lankan economy. Welcome back to Biz First in Focus. We're having a very interesting discussion with Shiran Fernando, the chief economist at the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. Regarding the state of the economy, we've covered uh, the currency, the exchange rate, the uh, interest rates, and the possible hikes of the uh, U.S. Uh, by the U.S. Federal Reserve of U.S. interest rates. Uh, we also discussed briefly the need for a central bank. Uh, finally, I'd like to come to uh, investment. Uh, for investment uh, in Sri Lanka, foreign investment in Sri Lanka is sort of about at about two percent of GDP. Is this 
considering uh, all that we've discussed so far and uh, the current uh, situation, the current realities in the Sri Lankan economy, is this figure a cause for concern? What should we be doing to increase it? So it is a concern, but it has been a concern over a considerable amount of time. So we've had very low levels of FDI um, compared to what we should be getting to move the economy to a sustainable economic growth uh, trajectory. So last year, I think we got about 1.7 or 1.9 billion US dollars. Um, so that compared to the last few years has been good. But if you look at it in terms of what other countries are doing, uh, what Vietnam, for example, is getting, it's, it's way, way more. And the more FDI you get, the less reliance you have on debt instruments. The less reliance you need to go out to the market, raise 1.5 billion, the less reliance you are on waiting for a disbursement from the IMF to uh, make sure that confidence is there. Um, and I think FDI investments and foreign investments are both a function of the operating environment you have. Um, so how much is doing business imp index or how much is the doing business environment improving? Um, countries like Vietnam, for example, have improved it in tandem with uh, getting more FTAs and things like that done and improving the environment overall for, for trade. And what we've seen is um, if you need to get more in FDI investment also, you need more stability. There's a very interesting uh, point that you mentioned, uh, Vietnam, because uh, on social media recently, uh, Dr. Rohan Samraji, the uh, chairman of the newly appointed chairman of the Information and Communication Technology Agency, ICTA, uh, noted that a key difference between a key variable between Sri Lanka and Vietnam in that period where Vietnam had managed to attract massive FDI inflows was that Vietnam had signed about 16 bilateral trade agreements. How important of a factor are bilateral trade agreements in securing foreign investment? So they are one part of the factors. I think it's, it's an important factor, but it's not the only factor. Um, for example, with the Singapore FTA, um, compared to the previous ones where you only talked about goods, which are just the exports and imports and whatnot, we've looked at investment and services. So that nexus is there, which is a conversation we've not had before. We've only talked primarily about goods. Here you have investments coming in that's linked to services, things like that, and that should overall help you know export growth and that going forward. But FTAs, if you don't have the environment as well, so you need more better domestic legislation, you need to improve uh, the ease of doing business here. So those need to also improve, and I think that's what Vietnam also saw in tandem with these FTAs coming through. So these FTAs are not sort of the B or not a silver bu bullet solution. So it's, it's not the end and all of it, yeah. but it's good. I mean, for example, the Singapore FTA, I think uh, the biggest plus point is that uh, we're, we're now showing a bit of seriousness in terms of uh, trade agreements. Let me try and, and sort of capture this in a nutshell. So basically, uh, just having the FTAs without having the domestic reforms yeah. uh, happening concurrently uh, sort of improving our positioning on the ease of doing business index, having more consistency in the yeah. taxation system. If all of that is not changing, then you're basically keeping the path open for cronyism to continue. Or you're not making best use of these uh, agreements. Uh, but I think to, to be fair on the policymakers, there are things that are being done uh, in terms of ease of doing business. We've still not seen the full uh, benefits of it. but. If you look at, for example, uh, investment uh, investment and investors interested in, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, this just this week, uh, the Salon Chamber is hosting its third um, annual uh, investment and business conclave. And this year, we've registered f um, more than what we did in the last two years uh, as well. So that shows us interest. Do you mean in foreign participants? For the foreign participants, foreign delegates. Uh, this is something else that sort of. Uh, probably ordinary people reading like uh, the business news section of the newspaper, something that you constantly see, uh, it's sort of a repeated yes. headline, is that this big global multinational, this big investor from uh, from the US or from the yeah. UK or from France, etc., has shown a keen interest in investing in Sri Lanka. Why is this interest that we hear about every week in the newspapers, why is this interest not translating into actual physical investment in the country. So I think that goes again once again to the uh, you know the doing business, getting these some of these uh, investment deals done. Um, 
sometimes these investors are interested in the market, but if things don't, the speed of delivery in terms of getting the approvals done are not met in time, then the interest goes away. Um, there could be even global changes within that overall structure that makes Sri Lanka no longer viable. Um, but I think there is a lot of interest. There is even some of these guys are some of them are looking for big projects. Some of them are looking for joint ventures. But all of them, I think, see a massive potential. They see the location. They see agreements like Singapore being catering to big markets. Uh, they see the logistics uh, uh, opportunities. Um, so they they sort of I mean we're we're sort of glued into this economy and maybe we're not seeing things in in a more holistic point of view. But they see where where Sri Lanka could possibly go, and where they could maybe plug in and, and one enjoy. final question before we wrap up. We see uh, when we're talking about sort of investment coming to the country. You mentioned that there is a need for uh, reforms. The pace of reforms or pushing for reforms has been slow. And within the political climate currently, it uh, would be almost wishful thinking to imagine that certain reforms that would be necessary to attract foreign direct investment would be pushed through. Do you feel that uh, in, uh, in favor of political expediency, you might have a situation where uh, FTAs are being signed and FTAs are being sort of championed, while at the same time, the other much needed reforms that should accompany the signing of these FTAs will be ignored completely. So reforms, I think, very much challenging in the next one and a half years. What practically could be done, what can be done with the consensus, the coalition government. Um, so I think right now you need to prioritize which ones should go ahead. If there is five, ten, without trying to do everything. Because I think what you've realized, if you look at the last few years, um, some of the bigger reforms uh, beyond RTI, the Indian Revenue Act, Forex Act. So these are big, big reforms that were somehow, I think, done by, done by the policymakers, by the government. Now it's what's next. And I think the key thing will be to improve our doing business environment, improve some of these institutions to be more private sector ready, to be more open. But at the same time, we've investment. also seen sort of steps like, OK, you take the VAT, uh, the impose yeah. VAT, then there are exemptions. Uh, it's like whenever <laughs> one group of people or one union yeah. or one uh, section of society makes a demand, <laughs> the uh, the government is so weak in its political capital that uh, it caves. So that's the that's the coalition dynamics that needs to be managed better, and I think that's also um, some certain stakeholders also need to be I think better managed, and that. All of that boils down to, again, that communication strategy, which has been sort of missing in the last three years um, with regards to this government. Thank you, Shiran Fernando, for taking time off and for uh, joining us on Biz First in Focus. It's been a most interesting discussion. Uh, key takeaway, maybe we're so glued into this economy that we're not seeing a completely holistic picture. What do you think? Don't forget to share your thoughts with us. I'm Nadim Majid. This is Biz First in Focus. I'll see you again on Friday on The Review. Until then, good night and good luck.